Hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining the panel session on inclusive industrial growth in, in Ghana. Let me first of all introduce myself and my fellow panelists here. So my name is William Atfield. I head up the trade and investment uh, portfolio for Palladium, a global positive impact company um, looking to deliver positive solutions with investors, investment promotion agencies, businesses and governments. And delighted to be here. Um, I've got an esteemed group of colleagues, many of whom I, I know well and have been interacting with over the last few years as part of the Ghana JET Jobs and Economic Transformation Program. So let me start off by introducing, first of all, we have Yuffie Grant, who is the CEO of the Ghana Investment Promotion Agency under the Office of the President. Yuffie Grant is a council member of the Continental Business Network of the African Union and a member of the steering board of trustees of the World Association of IPAs, as well as being a fellow on numerous um, academic institutions in, in Ghana. We also have Jeffrey James Apong Pepra here from the CEO of Volkswagen Ghana. Um, Ghana, obviously, um, leading automotive industry at the moment. Um, so delighted to have you with us here, Jeffrey. Um, and Jeffrey was also the former country head of a global freight forwarding and supply chain with over 74,000 employees in over 100, 100 countries around the world. Finally, let me introduce to you our panelist, Dr. Yor Adua Gyamfi, who is the chairman of the Dampong Group, which includes, includes Danadam's um, manufacturing and Dampong Healthcare. Dr. Yor Gyamfi is the president of the Association of Ghana Industries and a council member for several of the top tier um, Ghana universities. So I'll give a quick introduction to the session overall and contextualize the debate. And then I'm gonna hand over to each of the panel members to, to introduce themselves fully and talk to you a bit about where they see the challenges and opportunities for investment in industrial um, sectors within Ghana. So to set the scene, Ghana is one of Africa's fastest growing economies. Um, the launch of the Beyond Aid agenda in 2018 really set out clear objectives to create jobs, improve access to basic services and boost economic growth all of which are vital to reducing poverty in Ghana. And Ghana set out an ambitious industrial transformation agenda, focusing on driving big ticket anchor investment into priority or backbone sectors, including automotive, pharmaceuticals, textile, garments, and others. Industry is a powerful creation of jobs, especially SMEs who are the engine of job creation. So a key theme of, of this work is not just how do you grow the economy, but how do you grow, grow the economy in a way which is genuinely inclusive, is environmentally aware, um, and, and contributes to positive social, um, climatic, as well as economic impact. So taking quite a broad look at, at the at benefits there. So Ghana, I guess just I've pulled out some key statistics from um, an inception report we delivered a month or so ago. Um, so I hope these are uh, more or less accurate, but it's just to kind of, I guess, introduce the size of the prize. Why, why should we care as a prospective investor? Why should you be interested in talking to, to our colleagues here in Ghana? So industry is booming. Um, We've had FDI flows into, into Ghana over the last 10 years have increased significantly. And between 2015 and 2020, Ghana has been the number two FDI destination in Africa with 5.8% of their GDP, which equates to about 17 billion US dollars. So a fairly chunky amount there. The key investors have been within energy and in terms of repeat investors, we're seeing huge investments going into tech, media and telecoms at the moment and Ghana very much positioning itself as the gateway to, to West Africa. Finally, just to talk about a couple of the sectors as, as examples, we've got somebody here from Automotive, Jeffrey, and we have Dr. Yor from, Automotive, from Pharmaceuticals. So currently Ghana is selling around 110,000 vehicles per annum. And if you pan out and look across the ECOWAS region, that increases to about 500,000 vehicles per annum. Um, the recent investment by VW, um, which Jeffrey will be able to talk more about, uh, was a 10 million pounds investment into manufacturing. And we also see a number of the other automotive manufacturing companies like Nissan, Toyota, Kia, Hyundai, and others entering the market at the moment. 
Pharmaceuticals as well, another example of a huge growing market with an addressable domestic market of around $500 million um, and $6 billion if you look at the ECOWAS region more broadly. Currently, a lot of conversations in Ghana happening around um, post-COVID and vaccination, um, looking at Ghana becoming a vaccination producer within Africa. Um, so in short, industry very much center of the, the strategy for Ghana Beyond Aid, post-COVID recovery and inclusive economic growth. So this is a quick introduction to the, to the different sectors. The program that I'm working on at the moment is very much working with all of my colleagues here on the line, working um, on a UK government funded program called Ghana Jobs and Economic Transformation, which is a full five year program working with these key sectors to help accelerate anchor investment into those sectors. Uh, so really happy to be on this on this panel today, a real joy to be invited to speak and, and to, to have a chance to, to hear from our, our colleagues. So without further ado, let me hand over to um, Yofi Grant to introduce himself and give a bit of background on, on what he's been doing and some of the talking points specifically we're looking to cover off. Where are the big ticket industrial anchor investment opportunities in Ghana right now? What are some of the success stories and what are some of the challenges and learnings around those investments? Thank you. Over to you, Yofi. And you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I've done so many webinars. I constantly press the mute button. But no uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, William. And uh, those are very Pleasure. interesting questions that you ask. Uh, because maybe just to give you a little bit of background. Um, and um, right from uh, 2016, um, the feeling has been that the Ghana economy has not um, developed well enough to create wealth. And it was predicated on the export of raw materials and resources, mainly gold, cocoa, timber, diamonds. And, and so the new government in 2017, the president, um, the president Nanako Fado, thought that it was the best thing to refocus and redirect the Ghanaian economy and move away from the export of raw materials and resources into value addition and product, production. And so that is what began the story. But of course, to do that meant that, that there needed to be um, cleaning up of the economy a bit. So there was significant fiscal consolidation, better debt management, and intense reform agenda to make sure that the economy can actually accommodate that sort of change or swing. Um, and, and so that's begun a very interesting journey. The main um, trajectory through which this industrialization exercise started was a policy by name One District, One Factory, where government was going to assist the private sector to set up at least, at least one factory in each of the 260 districts. And that can be the foundations of an industrialization program, mostly based on our raw materials with agriculture also being a foundational substrate or raw material provider. But as you know, Ghana is resource rich, gold, timber, diamonds, bauxite, iron ore, lithium, manganese, um, there's timber as well, there's oil and gas. So all these could feed into a new industrial mix. So you ask the question, where are the big ticket anchor investment opportunities in Ghana right now? Indeed, post COVID, um, government came up with a plan called the Ghana Cares Obatampa Project. Ghana Cares been the COVID alleviation and revitalization of enterprises support. And strategically repositioned to focus on certain key areas that would build the economy back stronger, um, back to where it was pre-COVID. And these sectors are basically in agriculture because Ghana is basically an agricultural country. 60% of our land is arable land. Uh, we have some over 8 million hectares of land of which less than 30% is irrigated, but the potential to use that uh, for an industrialization program is very ripe. So the first was uh, um, agriculture. Um, increase in production, and then, of course, agro-processing. Then the other was infrastructure, that we need to build a strong infrastructure first to distribute into the sub-region, because one of the pivots of the, of the industrialization exercise was to Ghana, for Ghana to reposition as a hub for the sub-region or for the West Africa region. So that was uh, another of the strategies that you needed to make sure that you build the infrastructure 
Um, and the plan was for 4,000 kilometers of new railways and of course 10,000 kilometers of new roads that would actually uh, strip the country into every corner, every nook and cranny of the, of the country. And then of course, beyond that was the technology because um, government needed to create efficiencies in its engagement with the citizenry and technology um, is one of those um, things. And interestingly enough, with the advent of COVID, it looks like the world has really recognize the import of uh, technology and the, the use of technology for engagement. Um, and then beyond that too, because of the challenges we faced during the COVID period, health became critical. But prior to all this, of course, it was, it was admitted that we needed to upgrade the quality of the human capital to be able to transform the energy from one very you know fundamental of just exporting raw materials into one of value addition and uh, industrialization so government came into the policy of a free secondary senior high school policy and i must tell you something very interesting about that in this first year of implementation 1.2 million kids went back to school now they wouldn't have if there was no free school high school so it's very important for um, transforming the economy because in in the medium term the average education of the average Ghanaian would be at least senior high school education. Now, having set those fundamentals um, there, of course, the Ministry of um, Industry, Trade and Industry itself came out with a 10 point plan of industrialization, of which today we see um, the automobile sector, you know, sort of taking the lead, the pharmaceutical sector being the next, um, the agri sector also having been revamped and food processing taking many rungs up higher on the ladder. And, and then of course, technology. So there's been some significant, you know, attraction in the technology space with the government doing a biometric exercise of registering everybody in Ghana, as well as uh, registering all the properties in Ghana. Every five by five meter squared in Ghana, um, it has a digital address. Now that in itself, um, must be put in context because what government sought to do was to build a matrix of factors that would create an ecosystem or architecture of transformation. So get the kids to go to school, create uh, an enabling policy of the one district one factory, use the raw materials and resources that you have. Um, and today we are seeing um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire who are the major producers of the cocoa bean um, agree um, to cut down on the export of the cocoa bean and add value to it. Because from every bar of chopping, the farmer who produces the beans gets less than 5% of the actually sales price. So the essence of it was to transform the economy and move further up the value chain to create job opportunities for the young people and create wealth, um, which is a much better strategy than before. And so if you ask me, one of the big ticket industrial anchor investment opportunities in Ghana, there are several. It is pharmaceutical, it's in the health industry, manufacturing um, little health uh, um, um, inputs like stethoscopes, uh, um, intravenous infusion stuff, um, needles, et cetera, are all some of the opportunities that exist. But of course, there's also um, the big opportunity or what we call Agenda 111, which is building 111 health and medical facilities across the country, which is a major a major medical initiative, uh, the largest of its kind in our history. Um, and then of course, education, where the new boarding schools being built, new classrooms being built all over the country to make sure that uh, there are enough physical facilities to accommodate the large swell of intake with the uh, free senior high school. Then of course, in the agri sector, as I did mention, um, that is where I think the potential is biggest because we have the land and Ghana could as uh, could possibly be the brain, the, uh, the grain basket of the West Africa region if all those opportunities are exploited. But then of course, for us, the industrialization path is the most critical in transforming the economy fully. And um, the, the VW plant is a testimony to that. There's also Sinotrack that are also manufacturing and trucks in Ghana. There's Toyota and Nissan have already started assembling. And uh, Honda is looking to come, Suzuki is looking to come, Reno is looking to come. So that positions Ghana in a very interesting spot. But I think the major driver of all this is the signing of the AFC FTA, which creates Africa as the largest non-tariff market since the WTO. 
because once that happens, then it's, it's imperative that we move away from exporting the raw materials and industrialize for intra-Africa trade. I mean, Africa, with all its largest resources, is import dependent. We export our raw materials and they are processed outside and we import the finished goods. And I think it's about time to turn that around. And so industrialization also remains a key big ticket thing because that's the biggest employer, that's the biggest enabler, and that's the biggest transformer. The last but not the least, I would say, is also um, housing and real estate. Because um, without doubt, and it's just not in Ghana, the continent is, itself is faced with a, a huge um, um, home deficit. And uh, needs to, Ghana has a deficit of, of about 2 million homes and about 40,000 added every year. But yet the delivery is short of uh, 40,000. That means that there's a need an opportunity to do that in social housing and all that. So those are the key, uh, what I would say, the big ticket, you know, things. The industrial anchor ones will remain transforming our raw materials into finished goods. For example, chocolate. We are seeing a number of chocolatiers suddenly emerge out of this desire to stop exporting the beans and adding value. Um, for example, we have huge bauxite um, opportunities government's intention is to stop exporting the bauxite, to have it converted into alumina and then uh, refined into alumina and then processed into aluminum, which has a, a, a multiplier effect many times the bauxite. Then of course the iron and uh, iron ore deposits. Ghana has huge deposits of iron ore. And because we have bauxite, then we can actually combine the bauxite to the iron ore into a, an emerging steel industry in Ghana. Now, can you imagine if we had a steel industry and we had an aluminum industry? That in itself could open a huge, you know, gate of opportunities for uh, for automobile, for housing, for other industry. And because we are also oil and gas producing, we're going to use gas for our, our emerging fertilizer program to feed the agricultural sector, but also for other, you know, um, uses for plastics and other industrials. Um, and so yeah, we see, I'm are, going to have to ask you to wrap up very quickly. Um, yeah, it, it, to tell the Ghana story could take a good day because the good story take... to tell. The opportunities <laughs> are there. So I, I will leave yep. that. Um, some of the success That's... stories, of course, is VW and Sino. It's a fabulous intro. Really yes, helpful context here. Yeah, well. Another success story yeah. is Niche Chocolate, which is now you know exporting chocolate. There's Casa Preco, which is into liquor, which has built a huge market the sub-region and is one of the first companies to start trading on the African continent, the AFCFTA. Um, they are into liquor and, and uh, alcoholic beverages. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Please. <laughs> Thank you. And just to say from, from an outside perspective and, and someone who's worked doing similar kind of investment promotion, investment acceleration programs in, in multiple developing and emerging economies, I've been really blown away, I think, by the by the focus and the and the quality of the engagements, um, you know, with with the GIPC and with um, our colleagues from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And I think a shout out to the, the Honourable Minister as well, at the, um, who we're, we're obviously following his his keynote speech as well. But I think really, really impressive just how committed um, the government have been and how clear they are in setting out on that strategy. So that's the strategy. That's the theory. That's the vision. Now, we're very lucky to have not just the government represented here, but also the private sector. And I'd love to hand over now to um, Jeffrey James from VW to hear from an investor perspective. How has it been investing in Ghana? What have you learned? What, what would you advise others looking to invest in Ghana? Um, and what, what, are your, what are your kind of key takeaways that you could share with us? Thank you. William, thank you very much. And uh, once again, a big thank you to your feed who has really laid the foundation. I mean, you, you have said it all. I, I remember I was trying to introduce someone to Yofi and uh, and he said, oh, you know, the government, uh, are they going to help? I said, no, Yofi is the book of the investment uh, um, in Ghana. So contact him, he will take you through. And it, truly speaking, the government, um, agenda that they have, uh, it has been a very, uh, something that it's driving the industrialization very well in Ghana and a bit of you, we testified it. I mean, our key takeaways is for each 
um, government or for each country to move on to have the industrialization, to have the, uh, the FDIs coming in, it all works with government policy. And these policies, these are one of the key steps it drive us also into. Going back to 2018, where we had um, the German Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Merkel, and then also a year late before having the German president also in Ghana, we started this discussion on industrialization. And I quite remember that uh, back in, in 2017 in, uh, in Berlin, we started talking about this uh, initiatives. Uh, we saw that the government is very serious about the plan and, and what they had in the, for the, the pillars of the plan, the industrialization, the outline, was a key for us. So we didn't talk too much about it. I said, no, we'll take the initiative, we will drive it, and we just jump on it. And once we got in, uh, this was really... If you're breaking a little bit, I might pause. ...breaking uh, point for us. Because, I mean, well, is it better now? Yes. Yes, that's back. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. And again, the, this, this industrialization has been, uh, the agenda for the government has been a groundbreaking for us, which literally we saw that and we jump on it. And looking at the policies, the policies that we have for Ghana automotive industry was a key for us and we see, and we, during your inter introduction, you talk about Ghana being the fastest moving economy, that, which are all key factors that as an investors, we look at it and we saw that there's a plan, there's a strategy which lay grounds for us. So coming in, we just kicked it off uh, last year and Unfortunately, this pandemic, but uh, we were determined that no, the, get, the government paved the way, let's take the advantage, first move advantage and step in. And Marvelous, we've been, we've been very, I would say, our, we, will, we have been uh, very lucky, or it has been a tremendous uh, good project we started, because when we started, we didn't even thought we could move on quickly as, as we see today, but with a collaboration with the government, also giving policies that are being implemented for us to, uh, to move on with our projects, it was a key for us to move quickly on that. We had a pandemic, we go on lockdown, and when we came back, we still feel of you and said, no, we cannot, at that time we have people sent back to Germany and then to South Africa, but we still said, no, we need to move us. But again, COVID then taught us a lot of things. We became very proactive and we said, no, we have all the engineers gone back to Germany, but we have the local content, which is also a key for the government to transfer technology to the local people and also to bring standard. So we decided to use virtual approach using Skype and things to train our local technicians. And these guys are not engineers. They are near, uh, more or less uh, informal sector technicians that we got them on board. And that's what we see on the streets of Accra now today. The work you guys did through virtual. So what we have done uh, through virtual to train people, to equip them to become more uh, so strong in producing or assembling. Uh, it has become even a benchmark in the of uh, group now that uh, people now we try to do a lot of exploitation with that transformation in our tech technology. So again, with the back of government, policies helping us to grow, to giving us a policy that all the government institution, especially, this was also a key. So it changed the mindset, okay, we don't need to import, we need to support the local assembly. So this work all in the chain, that it helped us. And uh, we've been very successful up to date, 
we're still uh, looking forward to grow. Of course, our competition is coming in, but uh, I think we have benefit from this time. And talking about the anchor or the, the keys uh, from the automotive sector, Yofi talks about the bauxite. Well, Sorry, having some connectivity issues at the moment, Jeffrey. Okay, so what I'm going to do just pause the for a minute and let me pass across to Dr. Gianfi. Um, we'll come back to Jeffrey on the on the auto and particularly keen to pick up with Jeffrey. If, if you can hear this, we can't hear you, but I would love to come back to you on why Ghana as opposed to its neighbours and um, what would it take to you for you to invest further? And, and really keen to look at some of those localization opportunities. But while we're waiting for the internet to come back, I'm gonna hop across to Dr. Gianfi. Um, we met, uh, well, it must've been a, a good year or so back in, in, in Accra and talking about some of the opportunities specifically in um, vaccine production, which is a hot topic today. Uh, really keen for you to give us uh, some of your experiences in the pharma sector. Where, where do you see the opportunities in pharma? Why should investors come to Ghana as opposed to other places around the world and, and some of Ghana's neighbors specifically? Well, um, thank you for the opportunity given to me to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, when you look at the whole ECOWAS region, or the 300 million people, when it comes to Ghana stands out tall, we have to got companies in Ghana, but 10 of them are very exporting to almost to eight countries in the ECOWAS region. There are exports from, you look at the quality and in terms of evidence with the Food Drug Authority, they are the level four of the World Health Organization in terms of the inspection. So that will pro promote us as in terms of quality of our products region. When you look at Ghana compared to Nigeria, and even the nine Francophone countries in the West Africa, only Senegal has one factory of pharmaceutical. When you come to um, Burkina Faso has one. But Ghana has 33 pharmaceutical companies produced in Ghana and also with the exports. So for quality, for in terms of accessibility, Ghana is a place. And we are so bent on circle hub for the whole ECOWAS region for the making drugs to take care of the 300 million people in the ECOWAS region and to invest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gam Dr. Gamfi. And, and sorry, we had a, a couple of um, points there, the line dropped. So I think just to, to recap a couple of the, the points, uh, essentially- What saying I'm saying that basically, Ghana, Ghana Farmers out and we are bent on becoming the Farmers up region and even in place agreement. Why? Because we have quality products that we are producing here, all, all the pharmaceuticals in the Equus. We have the technical know-how. Sorry, you're you're still breaking up. So so maybe I could could summarize just some of those, those points because I've been listening. I, I've just some of them have been dropping. So um, quality of production, quantity, we're talking about 33 pharma companies compared to one or two in some of um, Ghana's neighboring countries, huge potential for growth. And you yourself obviously head up a, a large pharma group where, you know, look, looking at this and, and very much kind of driving that agenda for where there's opportunities to improve, improve Ghana's value addition to ultimately improve health provision to, to Ghana um, nationals and, and the Equus region more broadly. So a theme which we're seeing coming out across automotive, across 
textiles and apparels across all of these different sectors we're discussing here today is very much looking at how can Ghana connect through some of these free trade agreements, through the ECOS trading block, where are the opportunities to tap into a, a larger West Africa market? And, and that will be a theme we'll, we'll come and pick up on, on soon. Um, I'd like to go back to, to Yofi Grant, if, if that's okay, Yofi, um, and just get a sense of what, what is it that Ghana is doing differently to its neighbours? And how do you see the role of regional and continental trade blocks, for example, ECOWAS and the Africa um, Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, providing an opportunity for Ghana to really launch itself and its industrial agenda? I think Ghana, what Ghana, I believe, has gotten right is that the planning has been uh, complete and um, it's, it's not just a, a couple of activities, but there's a whole ecosystem of transformation um, uh, with little bits uh, forming a matrix to put together. And so that, that is what has, has made it possible. And secondly, mm -hmm. I think leadership is key. I mean, the Ghana environment itself is politically stable. Um, and of course, I mean, the, the rule of law is sacrosanct in Ghana. And so a lot of investors are protected from expropriation or pseudo expropriation uh, in the constitution and the GIPC law. And the fact that we have an aggressive reform um, agenda um, that engages and embraces the private sector, we are very open. I mean, I always call the Ghana story, the story of the three O's, opportunity, openness, and optimism. And out of these, by 2017, our GDP um, almost doubled from the 3.4 in 2016 to 8.1 in 2017. And for the next three years, it was growing at an average of 7% per annum, which was one of the fastest growing countries in the world. So definitely, I mean, once you have the key policies in your planning and you, you put your money where your mouth is and follow them and execute, you are likely to see progress. But that's just not all. I think what Ghana has done is also to try and take leadership on transformation of the continent to the, the maximum of the Ghana beyond aid, which um, in, 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 in our local I mean, dissemination, we say is building the wiser society, a wealthy, inclusive, sustainable, empowered, and resilient economy. You know, so, and, and, and the fact that we are willing to engage um, and also take a regional approach means that uh, we're able to attract investors who have a regional approach. Um, so for example, Google put, um, situated its artific African artificial intelligence um, and, um, laboratories in Ghana. Additionally, Twitter has also decided to put its, its, its regional headquarters in Ghana. And United Airlines is using Ghana as its regional hub. You know, um, we engage the investor, we find out what makes it possible for their business to work, having in mind the sort of ecosystem we want, and then we'll make it happen. So we are constantly engaged in, in, in finding solutions to the unique problems that we have, but not just from a Ghana perspective, but from an African perspective, because the AFCFTA gives us the market. We are even looking at attracting European manufacturers who are covered by the European Partnership Agreement to come manufacture in Ghana for the African market, instead of just bringing in goods tax-free. I think it makes a, a lot more sense for us. Um, and so that is where we are. And um, to boot, I think all these have earned us the regional headquarters of the AFCFTA. Um, and so Ghana has sort of positioned itself in the, the, the driving seat of the transformation, industrial transformation of Africa. That's, that's fantastic. And I guess one question from the, you talked about the inclusive environment and how this can create you know, wealth creation through the society. And we've, we've talked also in both the automotive and the pharmaceuticals about some of those opportunities to localize and create jobs. Where, where do you see the opportunities for, for some of those groups who are typically not necessarily included? So some of the poorer populations, marginalized, where would you see opportunities for job creation for women, for example, in, in these industrial sectors, which are, are typically kind of, you know, kind of male dominated industries um, historically. So very curious to get your take on how, how do you think Ghana can pave the way for a more inclusive industrialization? I, I, indeed, I mean, if you come to Ghana, I, I think gender, gender parity is one of the real strong policy initiatives that the president has initiated and is following up. I mean, um, we, uh, on, on the political side, even the women representation in parliament has been increasing. But not just that, 
Um, if you take the one, uh, the three um, senior high school program, for example, you'd realize that suddenly the proportion of ladies going to school has increased inordinately. Um, and women are going to be empowered um, at all stages to participate in the economy. Um, and, and so that is what it is. And, and there are quite a number of supported women groups um, that are actively working in commerce. So, so if you go to the North, for example, you have the shea butter industry is mainly controlled by women. The tomato um, transportation industry is mainly controlled by women. If you even come to the shores and uh, the fisher folk that are there, it's the women who do the commercial bit. The men go to sea, come back. It's the women who take control of the commercial bit. So there is a strong empowerment you know, agenda uh, within government, even within society for women um, to, you know, um, to uh, take uh, the reins of industrial or economic um, development and ride with it. Um, for the first time, we had, uh, um, we had a, a chief justice um, who was a woman. Um, we had a chief of, of staff of the president who is a woman. And so we have women in very prominent positions as well, demonstrative of this whole view of empowering women to take place. And of course, as you know, our president is a co-chair of the group of eminent people for the achievement of the SDGs. And uh, gender parity is one of those SDGs that he takes particular serious attention to. And he believes that educating more women, educating more girls um, is a very empower, empowering tool for national development. And that's where it begins. Thank you, that's a really, a really great answer. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask a, a question to the panel and, and, and feel free to respond both from the government side and the, the private sector side. But I, I think, you know, obviously the agenda was set out by key policy changes um, from the um, Africa or Ghana Beyond Aid agenda, um, the one district one factory policies. Um, and these, these are big policy changes which take a long time to really come through into effect. And for me, one of the things which has been really exciting and different about Ghana is its approach to very tailored solutions to specific investors. So whilst the policies are kind of rolling through, all of this work is happening, the big systemic changes going on, investors still want to come in, investors want solutions now, they want, they're looking at immediate opportunities to capitalize on economic opportunities to get a return on investment. Um, so how has Ghana uh, been able to provide and work with investors to provide tailored solutions to investor need um, over, the last, over the last few years? And really keen to hear from, from all of you on the panel um, in no particular order. The government has been a lot of setting up the, the Ghana Beyond Aid Committee, really chaired by the senior minister of Safumafu, with at least six ministerial committee. With that, they were whatever policies that were put together was able to be translated yeah. to their departments. And that is what we were put to do that. In fact, a, a whole policy profile was put together. There were six committees that were formed that were with different I mean, areas of industrialization. One was the infrastructure. One was to do the education and dealing with in terms of working. And with these areas, we were able to help in terms of actually coming out with policies to streamline the actual and drive the industrialization drive of the government. From 2016 till now, I can tell you that in terms of the sector or the business sector in this government has been very strong. And we know that without anything, things are going to continue at least for the next three or four years when we are looking forward in terms of the growth and creating opportunities in most of the sectors. When you look at having 23 different sectors, at least nine of our sectors have been very much strong in terms of growth. And we see that we are really, the private sector has been working in, I mean, coherently with the government to ensure that whatever policy driven by the private sector and that is really what is causing the growth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Giambi. Um, 
I'd really like to hear from uh, from Jeffrey. Jeffrey, if you if your connection is back, it would be great to hear the, the question again, looking at very tailored solutions for addressing constraints and challenges that investors are facing. How have how have you found working with the, with the government to help you overcome some of those challenges? You know, moving into a new market. No, I mean, as I said, can you hear me properly now, everyone? Yes, yes, much okay. better. I apologize for the breakup. Uh, as I was saying before, um, in terms of uh, investment FDIs into a country, it always required also political will that they want to go to. And this is where we've seen that from the automotive uh, side sector, the government has really given a plan. And in support of it, there's a policy also driving it. Because without a policy, I think we would have not really uh, make up to where we are. Of course, we have the policies in place. There are still some few things that uh, we think we need to explore more and, and to make the whole package complete. Because um, we're still looking at component manufacturing, which is the next key within the sector. Uh, myself and the, um, and the ministers, the sector minister, we've been discussing because it's something that we were going to need. And we will want to see that there are also policies going to be crafted or uh, for such sector to support uh, the auto sec uh, industry. Because the, when we talk about the man component manufacturing, this is one of the biggest key. It's a multiple um, sector where if you look at a full built car, think about uh, the components that is required to make a full final an FB filled unit. So this is something we also talking to the government to see that there's a, a policy going to be crafted to drive to drive this sector to support us for us to grow because. What we have started, there's a big appetite, there's a big uh, niche market in there, but we still need some other things to support that. So these are the areas that we're talking about. And of course, an area like financing, we are seeing that we need the support, we need policies to be driving this auto financing, which is a key to grow the market because we're going to produce we need to be driven by volume. Now we are in an SKD phase where we are doing an assembly. But in our plan, we're looking at to upgrade our SKD plant, but we're going to produce volume. Who buys it? There needs to be a financial aid to individuals, private sector, private uh, the government sector, to and then also financing for individuals to buy the cars. So if we have, we see also soft loans that are being given to individuals to give them a buying power, then it makes our investment also grow. So this is a point that we are discussing and we need it. It's, it's still not fully grown. It's part of the policy, but it needs to be explored further. If you look at the interest rate at the moment, it's gone down, but it's still, for an average Ghanaian, it's still tough. So we want to see some countries decided that we have uh, financial auto financing where people can just walk into a showrooms and get a brand new car. That will make the policy vibrant. That will make the policy uh, as we see. So these are key areas we have started. We, we are on the right track, and we need to put up other things together to make the value also come. And then we're talking about also the value chain topic, where we see that uh, the neighboring countries, you said in your introduction, Ghana is positioned as a world uh, gateway to West Africa. And we look at having Ghana as one of the automotive hub for the South region. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, let me, let me, can I, if I can cut in there, if that's okay, I, just to summarize, because I think you've raised a couple of really interesting points. And, and just as a heads up for the panel, I think we've got about 15 minutes left. And I have a couple of questions from the, from the audience. 
Um, but I would really like to kind of summarize because I think one thing which is so exciting with the automotive industry is that it's that transition over the four or five year period from entering a new market um, and, and assembling vehicles in a country to moving through a, a phase transition to actually not just assembling, but actually manufacturing. And typically that's a four or five year time horizon, I understand. And really, really exciting to see how um, VW and some of the other big players are really working with the government to look at those downstream opportunities. So where are the opportunities for component part manufacturers? And you know, fast forward 10, 15 years or so, and going back to what um, yeah, uh, Yofi was saying at the beginning about you know, aluminium, about the bauxite industries, there's enormous potential for really connecting and creating very integrated sectors here. So fantastic to, to hear about that kind of transition process and the, and the huge potential that, that that sector brings, not just for, for jobs downstream, but also for a lot of future investment opportunities within the sector. So the OEMs as anchor investors like VW, but hopefully there'll be opportunities to work with a number of local car firms, create opportunities for some of those really progressive, productive SMEs to start to enter those value chains and, and create, create jobs. I have, a, I have a question here from the, from the audience, which I'd like to ask, which was around the UK Minister for Africa, James Doddridge, announced a £250,000 investment package for Ghana on the 3rd of September, which will help su support four security and stability projects in Ghana. What does this commitment mean to the economy of Ghana? And I'm going to put that one to, um, to Yofi Grant, if that's okay, Yofi. Hello, hi. So um, unfortunately, Yofi's not here. I'm, I'm replacing him for now. Uh, I'll sort of try Welcome. to um, answer that question. I, I, my understanding is that preliminary um, discussions around what's the structure of that initiative will look like. So uh, to answer the question in due course, we'll sort of find out what the criteria is and what the sort of outcome, expected outcomes are for, for the program. So at this time, mm -hmm. that's all I No, no From problem. Thank you yeah. very much. And, and thank you for stepping in at, at zero notice there. Um, I'd like to, maybe I could ask you ask you one more um, while you're here. Would you, um, well, firstly, would you, do you want to just do a quick intro, um, introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Kiki <laughs> Ad, <laughs> your <piece> deputy. <laughs> Happens more than, uh, too, mu too many times, actually. Um, um uh, uh i am um sort of i came from the private sector so hopefully we'll be leveraging my experience there to you know helping gipc with its mandate so very excited to be here thank you so much we're very glad to have you um so obviously a lot of the industries we talked about we've talked about big investments for anchor investors to come in and we we've got you know someone from bw here talked about those we've looked at some of the potential investment opportunities in the supply chains of, of these um, key industrial sectors. One of the questions, and it was touched upon earlier with the automotive sector around capacity building and training, how, how, what are Ghana's plans to build the capacity and to make sure there's enough trained staff to actually come in and, and drive these opportunities and, and capitalize on the localization opportunities rather than firms coming into Ghana and bringing their own staff with them? Because obviously that's the that's where the real opportunity is for for Ghana to create that inclusive kind of wealth creation society. Um, so I'd like to put that back to you while you're on the line, and and then I think really just open the floor to any of our panelists if if they had anything they wanted to add, um, anything else they wanted to comment on that they feel that we haven't been able to cover so far. So uh, I'll put that one back to the, the GIPC and then open the floor to the, to the panel for uh, just a, a, a kind of closing discussion. So we're looking at it um, from two perspectives, obviously. So there's a policy side and there's like uh, an incentive side, right? So from a policy perspective, we are GIPC, we're coming up with reforms. As you know, part of our mandate is to sort of um, come up with um, the, the um, regulations that govern investing in Ghana. So we're looking at different, um, laws or, or putting into place different laws and initiatives that will look to sort of um, encourage responsible investing, mainly that, you know, a, an investor that comes in and, and is looking to train and, 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 and transfer knowledge will have certain benefits 
versus one that's sort of looking at a very sort of vanilla approach to investing. So that, that's on one side. And we, um, we uh, have been pulled into an initiative that is being promoted by the Ministry of Finance that's looking to create a mega project around training. Uh, and, and that will also seek to sort of look across the different industries, particularly the industries that, you know, that the government is trying to promote um, around industrialization and manufacturing. So really sort of looking to really um, build up capacity in core engineering, core um, technical skills. Uh, and that's sort of not from just a university perspective, we're looking across the chain, the chain in terms of um, the more technical universe, um, schools as well, as well as looking at our current curriculum. And I know that that's something the Ministry of Education is looking at how, what do we have to do to sort of change the way we approach our education system so that we're more competitive globally. So we're looking at, at it from both financial reforms and sort of the status quo uh, in terms of how we approach education really. So looking at the, the skills for tomorrow, um, I think in the, I think wasn't there recently, uh, was, it, was it VW who sent a, a team to South Africa to, to learn again from how South Africa has actually led on their automotive mm. industry to, to train some of their, their engineers and come back. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, what are, what are some of your, your thoughts and plans around how, how you can bring in some of the international and global best practice from, from around the world? Um, to make sure, because I, I think you, you missed the beginning of the conversation, but for, for me, certainly, the, the real opportunity here is that Ghana has the opportunity to industrialize differently and industrialize better than, for example, how, how industrialization happened in the West all those years ago. So really looking at how can industrialization happen in a more inclusive way, um, in a way which creates opportunities for women for some marginalized groups um, and creating the real opportunities for Ghana to industrialize in a way which can contribute to positive impact, social, economic, and environmental. I think we have to look to um, sort of Asia really, like how China did it, how Singapore did it, in terms of even as investors come in, sort of not only looking at um, capital injection, but looking at skills transfer and looking at structures that promote that, you know, because as you know, um, and from an investment perspective, you're always looking at the exit, right? So they're not sort of sticking around forever. So you should really look to find ways to integrate in such a way that, you know, there's knowledge transfer so that you can, so that there can be a trickle down impact. And, and from a, you know, an investment perspective, it's sort of long lasting. So I think those are the examples we should be looking at. And, and, and sometimes, you know, like you rightly said, it might, it might be a link to, you know, colonialism or, or something, but we always, the examples we use might not always be the right ones. And, and I think from a Ghana perspective, we're learning very quickly and we're looking at other economies that have, have gotten it right in recent times and, and, and we're trying to learn from that. So I think from a, um, a path perspective, we're, we're thinking about it differently and we're definitely on the right path. Thank you. And one last question before I, I wrap up and just thank, thank the panel. Um, Ghana is currently, as I understand, number two as an FDI destination in Africa. What would it take to move it to number one? Is that my question or anybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think, I think uh, you know, we, we, we are feeling some pressure from neighboring countries, but we're still very positive about how competitive we are. We're looking at you know, our refirms, our incentive structure, we're looking at sort of reducing barriers to entry in some cases. We're reducing bottlenecks, like for instance, at GIPC, we've introduced an aftercare division that's looking to really sort of map out the investor experience and optimize on it. Um, we're well aligned with a lot of the ministries um, more than we have been historically to really work together to, to make ourselves or position ourselves um, to be more accepting of you know, what it, what investor requirements are and more responsive to that. Um, so um, from that perspective, I think, you know, we're sort of, from a framework perspective, we've gotten better now. In terms of marketing ourselves better, we're also looking at ways to really um, look at the projects we have and make them more sustainable or, you know, bankable, you know, um, from a, a 
financial um, um, perspective in terms of like the, the, the landscape you've seen. I, I'm not sure if you're sort of um, following Ghanaian news that the president has really been really pushing the banks to align themselves, you know, with the policy changes that are, that are taking place from a um, Bank of Ghana perspective in terms of re reducing the cost of capital. So, from, you know, it, we're sort of aligning ourselves better. And I think that will position us as well as, you know, sort of looking at the regulations and streamlining that to make it more attractive. We're aligning ourselves to be very competitive and, and more accepting and, and ready to really push forward our investment agenda. So I'm very bullish on the fact that we, we will be able to become number one. Fantastic. And I think that's a, that's a really a really nice point to, to end the conversation today where we're almost at time. So I think let's, if we could conclude by just thanking the panel um, fantastic opportunity to hear both the, the government perspective and the investor perspective, and also hear from a, a large Ghanaian um, company, pharmaceutical company, discussing some of those investment opportunities. So thank you all so much for, for coming. It's been a, a genuine pleasure having you here, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so all the best, and over to the next session. Thank you. Located at the center of the world, Ghana is the best investment destination in West Africa and ranks as West Africa's first in the Ease of Doing Business Report 2019. It was projected as one of the fastest growing economies in the world with a growth rate of 6.8% in 2019 and has been declared as Africa's new bright spot after being ranked fourth in the world and first in Africa in the 2019 Global Retail Development Index. As the host of the African continental free trade area, Ghana is creating the linkages that will make it the gateway to Africa, aided by dynamic policies, a stable political environment, and strong economic fundamentals. It is a land of opportunities, offering businesses across many sectors the potential to flourish. The country is open and accessible to investors and the private sector, providing a peaceful environment and upholding the rule of law. The government of Ghana is confident and optimistic about the positive results in its investment drive through the GIPC. Ghana has 8 million hectares of arable land well irrigated by a wide network of water bodies, making it a region ready for large-scale mechanized agriculture. The government and major policy planners recognize that expanding the agro-industrial base is the best path to develop. Ghana has put in place the right legal and regulatory framework to increase foreign direct investment. The Industrial Zones program allows manufacturers and agro-processors to take advantage of favorable tax and duty incentives to produce for exports from Ghana into the EU and US markets. A rich cultural history and wonderful natural beauty makes Ghana a great tourist destination. The Year of Return Tourism and Marketing campaign in 2019 positioned Ghana as a key travel and investment destination for African Americans and people of the global diaspora. The year recorded significant increases in the number of visitors to Ghana. Ghana's growing consumer market is providing compelling reasons for investing in the services sector. The retail sector has been valued at $24.4 billion. A growing middle class with increasing purchasing power is creating demand for a wider variety of sophisticated services in healthcare, finance, and education. In the region, Ghana has one of the highest mobile penetration rates at 140%, with data penetration at 89%. The country has a thriving startup scene, helped by access to broadband internet that runs on fiber optic and 4G networks. The fintech industry is worth over 50 billion US dollars. Ghana is an English-speaking nation located in the center of the geographical world with flight times from Europe or America averaging about eight hours. Transportation networks in and out of the country 
have received enhancements in order to aid the ease of doing business. It has a new international airport terminal and an expanded port infrastructure. Tema Port is one of the largest in Africa, with a capacity to handle 3.5 million TEUs. The expansion in the economy is largely due to oil and gas development. Other sustainable sources of power, like solar, wind and thermal, will significantly increase the country's energy resources. We invite you to share in Ghana's optimism. Be part of the incredible opportunities we offer and be open to the idea to grow in Ghana and grow with Ghana.